It's also kind of ironic because, of course, the non-violent direct action that King was practicing came directly from somebody like Gandhi, and yet the American press could consistently talk about Gandhi as being an active agent, as forming, as rather wielding civil disobedience as a kind of weapon. Gandhi was talked about during the same period that these photos of Birmingham were being published as someone who took, quote, his own religious belief in nonviolence and from it fashioned a weapon of organized pacifism. One editorial in Life even wondered whether, quote, his weapon of organized pacifism might turn out to be the answer to the atomic bomb. That's a pretty, I don't know how that would work exactly, but that's pretty powerful stuff. And they talked about, in the same life issue in which Moore's pictures appeared, they talked about how he had, quote, forged passive resistance into a weapon. Another reason that seeing these images as simply a reflection of what was going on in Birmingham is difficult to do is because these pictures from Birmingham look so consistent with the ways in which blacks have traditionally been depicted in US culture by liberal whites who were trying to help blacks. I'm showing you here a medallion that was originally produced by a British anti-slavery society. It was reproduced in a popular medallion that circulated widely in the United States in the 18th century. And it shows famously a supplicant slave in chains on his knees asking, am I not a man and a brother? And of course, the notion of showing the slave on his knees asking this question, it's all about whites needing to realize that they need to set this slave free, not that the slave is agitating for any sort of reform. An even closer prototype, though, that also comes from the 19th century, is this daguerreotype called the scourged back, which was produced exactly 100 years prior to Moore's images of Birmingham. In 1863, a former slave that we know today only by the single name of Gordon, he escaped from the plantation on which he was enslaved and met advancing Union troops. We know that he showed great resourcefulness in rubbing onions all over his body so that he could escape the bloodhounds that were chasing him. We know that he served bravely as a Union scout. We know that he desperately wanted to enlist in the U.S. Army, the Union Army, and to be an infantry soldier, which he was eventually allowed to do. But what we also know is that the reproductions that circulated of him sort of stripped away any identifying markers, no background, no props, almost no sense of identity. We see his face only in this shaded profile. Where his identity comes from is those horrendous whipping scars that appear across his back. And the image circulated simply as the scourged back. It was used as an abolitionist emblem, both in the northern states but also in Great Britain during this period. His identity was simply reduced down to his suffering. And that suffering was understood as being seamlessly speaking to northern white audiences. Harper's Weekly, the kind of life magazine of the 19th century, reproduced the scourge back in its Independence Day issue in 1863. It referred to this as a typical Negro. So whether the identity comes from the scourge back or whether the scourge back gives us signs of what blacks are typically about, supposedly, in the 19th century, you can see that both in 19th century culture and in 20th century culture, a black body acted on by violent southern whites is seen as being a kind of key or entry point into getting northerners to feel differently about the plight of African Americans in, in the country. The degree to which northern whites needed to sort of decontextualize the civil rights struggle before they can empathize is made abundantly clear by the reaction to whites in the north once King moved his protests into northern cities. Just two and a half years after Birmingham, King moved into an overpriced, dilapidated apartment in Chicago's West Side slums to try and publicize a new housing and housing initiative and economic opportunities that he wanted to be granted to blacks in the north. This photo was taken in Marquette Park, one of the south side Chicago neighborhoods through which King marched, marched in 1966. It's a kind of photo that we expect to come out of the south, but historians have talked about the fact that when King turned against the Vietnam War and when he moved his protests into north, eastern, and midwestern cities, his support among liberal whites virtually dissolved. And the argument that I make is that when protests were set geographically, 
in distant locales, northern liberals could select the right pictures to make it look as if black rights were being held back by these racist southern whites, and to make it look like things could be solved by northern liberals who were willing to extend themselves emotionally. But when protests took place in the north, and when whites were forced to confront the agency, the unmediated agency of blacks in the streets, it became far too difficult for them to have that kind of sympathy. Now, it's one thing to talk about working class whites that were against King's integration marches, which, which is what's pictured here. But some of King's most liberal supporters in the Midwest, in Chicago, who said that they were totally in support of the Chicago campaign, as soon as it began, and they saw the violent counter-protests that took place, these liberal backers of King withdrew their support and made the claim that King actually had a moral obligation to halt his marches in, in the North. The same kind of marches he was engaged in in the South, but everything was apparently different for liberals once, once they moved North. Showing you a photo here that was taken for the Birmingham News. One of the interesting things is that northern white papers during the period, they had their photographers out taking pictures, but these were pictures that the papers would never publish. So most southern papers during the period in their archives have excellent pictures of civil rights, but no white audiences saw them in the 1960s because they just got buried in desk drawers. This is one example. So we see kind of chaos of the streets here. But what I want to point your attention to is here in the background, that's Charles Moore, the photographer who took all those photos with life, and he's kind of about to crouch down to take one of his shots of his famous dog attack pictures. And I want to read to you a little quote from Moore describing how he felt when he was in the streets here. And he said, quote, I didn't want to stand back and shoot the events with a long lens. I didn't have much equipment at the time, no lens longer than a 105, but even a 105 would have kept me out of the action. No, I wanted to shoot it with a 35 millimeter or a 28 millimeter lens to be where I could feel it so I could sense it all around me. I wanted to get a feeling of what it was like to be involved. So what I hope is clear from that quote is that Moore is actively concerned with getting himself as much into the action as possible so he can essentially take really close up scenes of these black, what's in his terms, black victims of white violence. And what I also want to point out to you is how closely this jibes with the quote that I gave you at the very beginning of what Connor wanted. Connor wanted to let white people in so that they could see the dog's work. I think that we need to bear in mind that Connor was vehemently against the Civil Rights Project. Moore was incredibly in favor of civil rights. Both had totally different visions of what they wanted American society to look like. But it's interesting to me that both had a similar interest in getting white audiences in to get these close-up views of brutalized black bodies. Both had very different kind of cultural work that they wanted to do with these photographs, but I think that ultimately both had a similar interest in giving whites a view of black bodies. In the one case, so it would be a kind of warning, look what happens to black people who get out of line. In the other case, so it can be a sign of, look what happens when southern whites lose their compassion, when they lose their humanity. But both men, as different as they were, as distant as they were on the political spectrum, both men had a like interest to provide a certain kind of victimized black body for white audiences. And that is because I think ultimately that both men based their kind of bedrock racial assumptions on the notion that the appropriate, normal, understandable, non-threatening place for blacks is as victims, is as people that are unactive, is as people that are acted upon. <laughs>